Can you guys hear me? Cool, great. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, I'm very happy to close out this panel. Um, and I'd like to uh, just start off with thanking York University for accepting my paper. I actually presented at this uh, exact same conference two years ago in 2018 when I was a master's student. So that's a very pleasing uh, circularity for me to be now in Canada and doing my PhD and presenting once again. Uh, and this paper is streamlined because of time constraints, but I'm trying my best to cover all my bases. So I'm just going to kick right into it and start off with, uh, oops, yeah, start off with this poem by a conceptual writer called Kenneth Goldsmith. Now, if you can see the poem on your screen, it doesn't really look like our understanding or our preconceptions of a poem. Uh, we can look at the first line here, and I'm just going to be doing a close reading of the very first line. All the news that's fit to print. Now, the first thing that comes to mind, the first kind of... Yeah, I'm done. Sorry? I don't know. I'm pretty bad. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, yeah, I think we've got some mic that's turned on. Uh, so the first, the first thing that we kind of understand from this, uh, from this poem, uh, the, first, the first potential meaning we could tell from it is that uh, the line testifies in part to the poem's conceptualization uh, as a word-for-word -word extensive transcript of uh, an issue of the New York Times, specifically the September 1st, 2000 edition of the New York Times. And uh, that's quite, kind of obvious if you just sort of like read the first few lines uh, for the name of the paper in it, you've got the edition, the weather forecast, uh, and so on and so forth. However, if we read it as a line of poetry, uh, it kind of takes on really like interesting implications. The first thing we notice, for example, the kind of very pleasingly trochaic rhythm of the line, all the news that's fit to print. And in the kind of, uh, in the later half of the phrase, fit to print, we might think about how this line is perhaps a potential rejoinder or an anticipation of the criticism that this poem might, might get. Uh, someone might pick up this book and flip through it and be like, oh, it's just like this guy's just typed out the newspaper. Is it really fit to print? Uh, we might also focus on the word there at the start, all the news. And we might um, think of Ezra Pound's kind of famous exhortation to the modernists to make it new. Or we might also think of Pound's uh, maxim that poetry is news that stays news. Uh, ironically, this, all these interpretations would be anachronistic because uh, this particular slogan was coined in 1897, which predates Ezra Pound's uh, in, uh, kind of maxims and slogans by some three decades. So in that sense, uh, this would be old news. So I kind of want to move on and think about, talk about Goldsmith and his explanation of his own work. So Goldsmith is a proponent of a, of a school of writing, conceptual writing, which consciously responds to computing technologies and the internet. And in the foreword to an anthology of conceptual writing that he put together in 2000, I think this is 2009, uh, Goldsmith argues that the internet is for writers what photography was to painters in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, photography came along. It drastically disrupted painting because uh, photography was just so much better at doing the thing that painters have been trying to do, which is to try to mimic nature and to pr provide a kind of like a uh, uh, close approximation of what reality was. And Goldsmith argues that because of that, painters had to go soft. They had to go into impressionism, surrealism, and so on. And so the internet has kind of like position has, has posed that same challenge to writers uh, because it's just flooded our daily experience with an unprecedented amount of textuality. So the role of writers as being kind of the originators of text, of language now, um, has been destroyed. We're not that special anymore. The poet sitting down to write a sort of six lane poem is not that special anymore when everyone's clever writing Tinder bios and so forth. So faced with that kind of challenge, Goldsmith argues that the writer needs to instead embrace the, the functions that are unique to technology, copying, pasting, editing. Um, and so that results in the kind of work that he's put forward. Now, obviously this Goldsmith is being deliberately provocative. Um, I would argue that his work isn't just strictly intellectual that there are times where his work could be emotive or even affective. And uh, I'd like us to take a look at this next poem by him. 
It's called Metropolitan Forecast. And as you can see, uh, this poem kind of adopts the same concept as the first poem as day, except he applies it to the September 11th, 2001 edition of the New York Times. And so let's read this again as, as a poem. And we can see that uh, it's actually, to me, it's actually quite moving because we're reading sort of like the simple future tense of sentences like noticeably less humid air will filter into the metropolitan region. Uh, skies will, will be clear overnight. Just a few clouds will fill the sky. So there's a kind of confidence to the forecaster when it was originally written. But we as the readers reading this in 2020, there's a kind of like, uh, we're kind of like doomed oracles because we see what the forecaster cannot. We see that the skies on this particular day will be filled with like, you know, clouds of, of smoke and people jumping from buildings and so on and so forth. So to that extent, I do think that Goldsmith's work is capable of kind of producing the kind of uh, affect that we associate poems with. I'm just gonna drink water. Okay, so when we examine Goldsmith's justifications and his kind of um, explanations of his praxis, uh, we see in his work a kind of unusual, or maybe not unusual, uh, an extensive amount of reliance on critical theory. So Goldsmith is a very savvy guy. His position, his own practice within the kind of uh, the lineage of postmodern and critical theory. Uh, in, in that same kind of mythology, he argues that conceptualizing executes the authorial depths reported in the top set by Roland Barth and Michel Foucault. So in a sense, Goldsmith sees himself as participating in the 20th century project of decentering the liberal human subject. And um, we might even think about, so, so Marjorie Perloff has positioned Goldsmith as kind of a heir to, to, to the language writers. People were thinking of like Charles Bernstein, Ray Armitrow, Susan Howe, uh, people who in their own work try to kind of take apart the idea that poems are always related to like uh, individual subjects as well. Um, so we might even see Goldsmith's work as very, as kind of like making literal the processes of quotation and intertextual reference that Bath might have on, uh, kind of uh, used metaphorically. And then we could go on here to further think about uh, Bath's distinction between readerly and writerly texts. Uh, and it kind of corresponds to the, to the distinction between low and high culture that uh, Peter was talking about earlier with the culture industry. So readerly texts are texts 